Uh, thank you, Papi, for praying. We have come to the 12th verse of the 5th chapter of Romans, and we're going to carry on with the 13th verse. But the 12th and 13th verse are interlinked, and therefore I will read the 12th verse again, and we'll go on from there and talk about sin and how salvation came through Christ, victory over sin. Verse 12, uh, which you did last uh, time, is written, Just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way, death came to all people because all people sinned. It was all sin. So one man, Adam, sinned. He died. Died means cut off from God, separate from God. Death means separation. And uh, in this way, death came to all people because all people sinned. But we read about Jesus. He never sinned. He shouldn't die at all. Because if death came because of sin, he never sinned. He shouldn't die. But 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ died for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. Once he finished it, he had to rise from the dead because it was impossible for death to hold him. Acts 2.24. So we can easily answer the questions to people. Normally you quote Romans 5.12, they will say, in that case, Jesus also sinned, he died. He also must have sinned, but he died for our sins. And death could not hold him because in him there was no sin. Then verse 13, Paul writes, For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Always there has been sin. What is sin basically? Well, there are differences for sin in the Bible. Uh, 1 John <clears throat> uh, chapter 5, verse 17 says, All wrongdoing is sin. All wrong. You know something is wrong and you do it, you're a sinner. That's called the sin of commission. There's also a sin of omission. What is sin of omission? James 4.17. He knows the good he ought to do, doesn't do it, he sins. Suppose something good he don't do it, that's also sin. So sin of commission is doing something we should not be doing. Sin of omission is not doing what we should be doing. By that standard, all have sinned. And this sin was there from the very beginning, before the law was given. The law only confirmed we are sinners. As you looked at this particular verse last time, in 1 Corinthians 15, 56, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. There's a law, we break the law, and sin has power. Sin, 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 has, sin has power, death strikes us because of sin. But that has always been there. Ever since man sinned against God, there has been death. Because man has sinned. He has crossed the limits God has set. And therefore, there's always been uh, you know, uh, disobedience, wrongdoing. And it's like, you know, uh, Psalmist uh, David says in Psalm 51 verse 5, In sin I have been conceived. From, from birth, I have the potential to sin. Every human being naturally will sin when he grows up because the potential is already there in, 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 in the child. Uh, it's like a caterpillar and a butterfly. We all know that the butterfly comes from a cocoon, but inside the cocoon, it's a caterpillar. A caterpillar will become a butterfly only. It can't become anything else. Similarly, a child will ultimately become a sinner only. He understands the law, he breaks the law, becomes a sinner. But there's no law, sin is not taken into account. But the fact is, you have, you have gone against your own conscience. And therefore, everybody is born in sin, and the law only regulates it, made, made, confirmed to us that we are sinners. The law was given about 430 years after Abraham. But then the Bible says about Abraham, in the book of Genesis, 26 chapter verse 5, he kept all the requirements, commands, degrees, statutes of God. He kept the laws of God. There was the law given to Abraham. It was in his heart. So from childhood, we know certain things that are in the heart, and we don't obey our conscience, and therefore we are sinners. So always there has been death, even before the law was given. And Paul says right here, Sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Nevertheless, verse 14, 
death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even though those did not sin by breaking command, by breaking command. You may not have sinned by breaking a command, you didn't have a command, but there's been sin because you are not being faithful to your conscience. You've been taught right and wrong from childhood, always you've not been right, and because you have not obeyed what your conscience tells you to do, the spirit has become contaminated, therefore we die. We are not sinned by breaking a command. There was no command. But Adam, as the Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come, Adam had instruction given to him by God, both Adam and Eve. If we eat from that fruit of that tree in the middle of the garden, you will die. He was told, don't eat from that tree. Every tree in the garden you can eat. Don't eat from the tree of the, in the middle of the garden, the fruit of the tree. If you eat of it, you will die. That was a commandment. Consequence also was given. But even Adam, they transgressed that instruction and they died. Since then, mankind always had the potential to sin. A child has the potential in the child to only sin only. But when the law comes and they break the law, you become a sinner. It's like a caterpillar. When you kill the caterpillar in the cocoon, it dies as a caterpillar, not as a butterfly. Ultimately, you become a butterfly only. A child will become a sinner only, ultimately. But the potential to sin is there in the child. You don't teach a child how to disobey parents. You teach the child how to obey parents. Disobedience comes naturally. Obedience comes from training. So every human being has a period of rebellion when you're born. But as we grow, we understand right and wrong. And at not all times you have been having clear conscience. Therefore, spirits are contaminated. And the only solution for that is the grace of God that came through Jesus Christ by his blood we have been, our spirits have been cleansed and we are made righteous by the blood of Christ. So let's go on from there. Verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. Gift of God is salvation. And the word gift, by the way, is a word called charisma in Greek. Charisma. And actually means free gift. Free gift. Charisma. Charis means grace. Charisma is a gift of grace. Free gift of grace. Salvation is by grace. We don't deserve salvation. We are given salvation. It's a gift. A gift is not earned. A gift is received. Charisma, a variant of charis. Charis is grace. So gift of salvation is by grace. And in 2 Corinthians 9.15, Paul writes, it's an indescribable gift. Charisma means free gift. Here it says gift, but it's a free gift. Freely received by us. And this is an indescribable gift. You can never describe salvation. We have four days of salvation in the context of joy and peace and assurance of salvation. But only when you go to heaven and understand what we really have escaped. We escaped the lake of burning sulfur and if you are in the kingdom of God, there's no crying, no mourning, no sorrow, no pain, no death in heaven. Eternal fellowship with God, eternal bliss, no wild thing will ever enter that. And it's indescribable, you can't describe it. Just thank God for the salvation, the free gift of salvation. And here Paul writes, the gift is not like the trespass. The word trespass is from a Greek word called paraptoma. Paraptoma, it means transgression, transgression. Trespass means transgression. It means crossing the boundary. God has set certain boundaries for us. We cross it, we become trespassers, transgressors. Look at a simple example. When you walk along the road, you see a property. And uh, there's a gate, there's a fence, and there's a board which says, Trespassers will be prosecuted. Trespassers will be prosecuted. I mean, don't enter this, this land. It belongs to a private party. Private party, don't cross this boundary. 
Don't enter the gate. If you enter, you are trespassing. If you are trespassing, you will be prosecuted. Transgressions. Crossing the boundary. In spiritual terms, God has set boundaries for us. Don't cross this boundary. If you cross that, you are trespassing. Adam was told, don't eat from that tree. Don't eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat from that, you are trespassing. You are crossing my limits. And you will reap the consequence of it. So the gift of God is not like the trespass. Gift is freely given. And trespass has consequences. Without the grace, there are consequences. So trespass is basically paraptoma. Second part of verse 15. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, one man, Adam, crossed the boundary, ate from the tree, should not have eaten. If one man did trespass and we face the consequences, if the many died by the trespass of one man, where Abraham's descendants and sorry, where Adam's descendants also, he trespassed, we also trespass and we face the consequences. How much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus, overflow to the many? If by one man's trespass, death came, we are all descendants of that Adam. How much more, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Verse 16. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. We all discussed before, every time we'll be telling this, that justification, righteousness, both mean the same. Dekaiosone in Greek. D-I-K-I-S-O. Sone, U-N-E, Dekar Sone. It means uh, justification or righteousness. We are made righteous by the blood of Christ. His blood is a gift for us. We receive this freely, charisma, free gift. We receive that gift and we are made righteous. And if one man sin, by one man sin, they become trespasses and we have faced the consequences. How much more through one man's obedience we are saved, we are made righteous. That's why salvation is entirely by grace. We can't earn it, we receive it. Verse 17, very powerful verse. For if by the trespass or transgression, paratoma of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? What a powerful verse. I want to spend some time on this. If by trespass or transgression of one man, death reigned. Today, death is reigning in the world. Everybody dies. Every human being dies. Believers, unbelievers, atheists, all human beings die. Why? All human beings are sinners. The ultimate proof we are sinners is that we die. We are cut off from God, separate from God. And Paul writes here, if by one man's trespass, death is reigning, how much more will those who receive, he talks about two things, the abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life. Death reigns over the world. We reign in life. While living in this world, we reign over every problem in this world. How can we reign over every problem? By receiving. By the way, the word receiving is lamba, lamba non tes. Lamba non tes. Now I want to give a parallel to this. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, we read, Jesus told the disciples to stay in Jerusalem till the clothes of the on high. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. 
receive power. Who has become the pony? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, outermost parts of the earth. The word receiving there is lambano. Here the word is lambano tes. Similar. What does it mean? Lambano means filled and overflowing. And this word lambano tes used here, the same in the gift of righteousness, the abundant person of grace, is basically a variant of lambano. Again, receiving and overflowing. Abundant provision of grace. Grace is not just for salvation. Grace is for Christian life. Today we live by the grace of God in every aspect. By grace he gives us wisdom. By grace he gives us strength and power. And it's not just limited to salvation. Two things Paul writes about here. To reign over life. Life has problems. In life, everybody faces problems in life. Let's face it. Different kinds of problems. But by receiving two things, the gift of righteousness and the abundant provision of grace, we will reign in life. In a difficult world, with a difficult life, we reign over it. For the people of this world, death is reigning over them. Death is reigning because of one man's sin. How much more by receiving, meaning filled and overflowing, we will reign over every problem in life by receiving two things. Number one, the gift of righteousness. righteousness. Number two, the abundant provision of grace. Gift of righteousness is Christ. Christ is our righteousness. We often discuss in the last two sessions also. 1 Corinthians 1.30 Christ has become for us wisdom from God. That is our, our righteousness, wholeness and redemption. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says God made him who had no sin to become sin for us or become a sin offering for us. That in him we might become the righteousness of God. Today we have become the righteousness of God. Because we are made righteous. We are justified by the blood of Jesus. So Christ is our righteousness. This is something that Jews did not understand at the time of Paul. They don't, they don't receive Christ as a, Jesus as the Christ. They didn't believe he is the Christ. And they had their own righteousness. And Paul wrote about them to the Romans. Romans chapter 10, 3 and 4. About the Jews living during his time but not believe that this Jesus is the Christ. About them, Paul wrote. So they did not know righteousness comes from God. They sought to have their own righteousness. Christ, the end of the law, am I righteous in him? Am I righteousness in him for everyone who believes? Is the end of the law, the fulfillment of the law, complete, ultimate. So when we receive Christ, we receive righteousness. That we have done Believers have done that. Not only we receive the gift of righteousness, that is Jesus, we receive the abundant provision of grace to be able to reign in life. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him for us, how will not along with the son graciously give us all things, all things we need for life and godliness, to be able to reign over every problem in life are uh, given to us by the abundant grace of God. So by receiving Christ, which you already done, thereafter receiving more and more grace from God, manifested in wisdom, in strength, in faith, in love, in hope. Let me repeat that. Wisdom, freely given. Strength, freely given. Faith, freely given. Hope, freely given. Love, freely given. All given by the Lord, freely, by His grace. We only have to receive that grace. In that process, we will be able to endure hardships in life. The Apostle Paul commended the church in Thessalonica for the endurance that came from hope. 
They endured suffering because they had a hope. We have the same hope. And Jesus is a personification of hope. First Timothy 1 1. Jesus Christ, comma, our hope. Hope is a person. Like peace is a person, the same person. Christ is our peace. Micah chapter 5, verse 5. He is our hope. So by holding on to hope, we endure difficulties. They reign over every problem in life by simple obedience. Ultimately, all points, uh, points to obeying him, his teachings. In that process, in spite of difficulties, we will reign over difficulties. John 16, 33, Jesus says, I've told you these things, that in me you will have peace. In the world, you will have troubles. But take heart, I overcome the world. To be able to obey the Lord, he gives us wisdom, he gives us strength, freely given by his grace. As we obey him, we preserve the peace of the Lord and the joy of the Lord. And thereby, we reign over every problem in this world. The Lord never told us, you follow him, you won't have difficulties. Hidden promise of life, promise us a life free of difficulties. In fact, he promises difficulties. In the world, you will have troubles. But take out, I will come the world. But you can reign in life over the problems of the world by receiving more and more abundant grace, which I will shower upon you. So key is to endure trials by the grace of God. I repeat that beautiful verse again. Romans 5.17. After explaining, no, I want to go back to it. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned with one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace, number one, and the gift of righteousness, number two, reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Apart from we can do nothing. Grace is showered upon us through him. And we will reign over every problem in life. We all have problems, but we can reign over the problem simply by the grace he has showered upon us. Okay, let's go on. Consequently, verse 18. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, one trespass was that of Adam, condemnation came for all men. So also, the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. How beautiful this was. I want to repeat that. Slowly, I read it out. Take it to heart. Just let it go deep into your heart. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass, that is Adam, he had transgressed the boundary. Don't eat from that tree. He ate. He trespassed. Because of that, was condemnation for all men. So also, the result of one act of righteousness, that was Jesus, sinless life, was justification that brings life for all men. For all men, we have eternal life and abundant life. Then life starting at the point of time, we accept Christ as Savior and Lord, and abundant life in this world as we live for Jesus. That abundant life includes reigning over every problem in life. Abundance of peace, abundance of joy, abundance of wisdom, abundance of strength, all freely given. We only have to receive. And God shows no favoritism. He'll give to everybody who's willing to receive. receive willing to receive by through humility. Verse 19. For just as to the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, many will be made righteous. Sometimes people question, you know, Adam sinned and we all died because of, why should I be blamed because my forefather Adam sinned? It's very unfair. I'm dying because he sinned. But look at the solution for the problem. Even before man sinned, Christ was chosen as a savior. Do you know that? It says in the Bible. 1 Peter 
Second Timothy 1.10, both talk about how Christ was chosen Savior from the foundations of the world. People ask this question to me. God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. He knew man would sin. He's omnipotent. He could have prevented man from sinning. Why did he do it? Why didn't God prevent Adam from sinning? My answer is, yes, he's omniscient. He knew man would sin. He's omnipotent. He could have prevented man from sinning. But he won't force his will. He's omni-loving. So before man sinned itself, Christ was chosen as a savior. He chosen as a savior before man sinned. What an awesome God. And today, because one man sinned, you all die. So one man's obedience, we're all saved. Look at the solution he's given us. Why are you complaining about the problem? We have a solution. Through his righteousness, we are made righteous. And this gift is for every human being in the world. Nobody can say, you know, God is very unfair. All mankind can receive this salvation. If they don't receive it, it's their problem. It's their pride. Pride hinders grace. God gives grace to those who are humble. So while one, one side we feel bad that we all died because of Adam's sin, let's thank God that because Christ's obedience, we are made righteous. And we go to heaven because of what he had done for us on the cross. So also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. So by believing in Christ, we are made righteous and we are justified to go to heaven. So thank God for the solution. Don't blame God for the problem. Let me repeat the statement. Don't blame God for we dying because Adam sinned. I'm not responding, Adam sinned. Why should I die? Well, it's true that we all die because of Adam sinned and we all sin. But look at the solution. God himself came to the world. Emmanuel, God with us, lived a sinless life, died among criminals between two robbers for our sins, took the pain on the cross to give us salvation. Look at the solution. Why are you always focusing on the problem? Problem has been solved once and for all by the will of God. Hebrews 10, 10 says, by the will of God, by that will, we all been made holy to sacrifice the body of Christ once for all. Once for all made holy, once for all made righteous. Hebrews 10, 14. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Praise God. Praise God for the amazing grace. So don't look at the problem, look at the solution. When you share the gospel with people, when you talk about sin, say, yeah, sin was there, but the solution was sin. He's taken away sin on the cross. Come to the solution, don't go to the problem. And in the solution, we have abundant life and eternal life for every one of us. May God bless us as we take to heart whatever is mentioned. Very, every verse is so powerful, you have noticed it. We're going to go slowly in the fifth chapter of Romans, the whole of the book of Romans. The gospel is contained in this particular book. I bless Corinthians 1st and 2 and Galatians. God bless you all. So please come back after reading the entire fifth chapter and sixth chapter also. On, uh, on uh, Friday, not Wednesday. Wednesday won't have the meeting. I've got a family function to attend here in Chennai. That's why I come to Chennai. On Friday, we'll continue uh, from verse uh, uh, 19, I think. Yeah, which, which was <coughs> from verse 20, we'll, we'll, we'll continue. God bless you all.